Hello, my name is Yvette. I have been a volunteer at Chawton House for 10 years, often giving guided visits of the gardens to our organised tours. Join me for a quick walk through our charming and intimate gardens. In a southeastern corner behind the house is a tranquil area known as the Lower Terrace. We have two terraces, one upper and one lower. The two large mullioned windows overlooking the terrace belong to our two reading rooms, so not surprisingly, the terrace is also known as the Library Terrace. It is an enclosed terrace on three levels with a lawn and retaining walls in Marnstone and Flint similar to that used on the Elizabethan frontage of the house. It was created for Montague Knight, grandson of Edward Austin Knight, in the early years of the 1900s by friend and garden designer Edward Lutchins and is built in the arts and crafts style. The garden details that are associated with Lutchins are the curved half tower details, the risers and the two millstones. During the restoration of the gardens, this area was planted to reflect the style of Gertrude Jekyll, a friend of Lutchin's, who worked with him on many garden projects. Today, the garden is planted to be a white garden, although the odd, colourful historical specimen still pops up every now and then. The white theme pays homage to the 20th century writer, Rita Sackville West, creator of the white garden at Sissinghurst, Kent, and a writer and biographer on Afro Ben one of our pioneering early 17th century writers, the first professional woman writer. But before we leave the terrace, spot the late 18th, early 19th century Portuguese tile set into the wall. The garden has five such tiles, four Virgin Marys and one bearded man, plus two heraldic tiles, all set within walls that Montague Knight has some involvement with. After winding our way up the gradual rising path that is the Serpentine Path, we arrive at the Upper Terrace, the path of which was uncovered in the year 2000. The brickwork, balustrade and steps were laid down in the early 1900s and formalised the raised grass bank. But the best thing about the Upper Terrace is the view. Today what you see is a restored English landscape of the 18th century perhaps laid out between 1763 and 1785. This style of garden landscaping began in the 1720s and 1730s and swept across England during the Georgian period and beyond, and included such persons as William Kent with his natural Arcadian landscapes of temples and statues, through to the more natural and minimalistic park landscapes pioneered by Lancelot Capability Brown, which were then further developed by the improver Humphrey Repton. It was also a landscape influenced by the aesthetic picturesque principles of William Gilpin. The trend towards this style of landscape was revolutionary and driven by fashion, and it changed the look of most great house gardens completely. Jane Austen herself satirises Gilpin's picturesque ideology in her novel Northanger Abbey, and alludes to it in Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, and refers directly to Repton in her novel, Mansfield Park. So, before Chawton House Gardens had its 18th century makeover, what were they like? Fortunately, you have in the collection a large painting dated circa 1741, known affectionately at Chawton House as the Mellichamp painting, after the artist who painted it. The painting depicts a house within its formal gardens. Typically, the house and gardens are surrounded by enclosures, areas divided from each other by walls, hedges and or fences. Here we have much use of brick, 
an expensive commodity and status symbol, and that gives the painting its overall orange feel. The gardens step up from before the church and continue around the side of the house in a series of tiered terraces accessed by steps. The garden areas are formal in style with clipped grass, topiary and clipped and shaped hedges. Spot the procession of cats or is it dogs walking along the top hedge? These gardens can look simple, but they would have been hugely labour intensive, especially when you consider the first lawnmower would not be produced until the 19th century. Along the top of what is now the South Lawn, we have evidence that there were a series of formal and geometric beds, made up perhaps of herbs and bedding plants within dwarf box surrounds. The raised bank, now the upper terrace, was the back of the formal terracing and would have provided a perfect point to view the garden, as would the principal windows of the house. A short walk along from the upper terrace brings us to the walled garden a favourite place for many, and a haven of serenity, fragrance and birdsong. It was constructed between 1818 and 1822 for Edward Austin Knight, and is referred to in a letter written by Jane to her brother Francis in 1813. Sadly, Jane Austen did not live to see it completed, as she died in 1817. The walled garden replaces a previous kitchen garden situated opposite the drive entrance to the house and that garden also had replaced a previous walled garden to the south of the church and close by the wilderness. The walled garden was removed during the landscaping of the 18th century. The walled garden is a large rectangle shape and it is said that it was constructed one wall at a time and this would seem to be backed up by a documented planting scheme for the walls referred to as the New Ball. The walled garden in Edward's time was a large orchard with many apple trees underplanted with gooseberries and currants, with walls covered on both sides, except the north wall of course, with a vast variety of fruit trees, pears, apricots, nectarines, plums, green gauge, cherry, etc. Including the Moor Park apricot dismissed as tasteless by Dr Grant in Jane Austen's novel Mansfield Park, which was written in 1813 when much of the garden improvements were happening at Chawton House. From the 16th through to the 19th century, it was appropriate and a mark of status that a gentleman should be actively and practically involved in a cultivation of fruit. Today, apart from the odd tree, the orchard, not surprisingly, does not exist. A small orchard of heritage apple trees, once known to Edward Austin Knight, were planted at the end of the walled garden during the restoration of the gardens in the early 2000s. The walled garden we see today is a garden that has seen many changes. Montague Knight converted the walled garden into a flower garden and constructed a wall across it, complete with ornate gates believed to have come from Nuremberg. He also opened up the west wall and erected two pillars capped with an acorn either side. Of course, there is a Portuguese tile on both of these walls. The large opening provides a grander entrance than would have been there before and it creates an area of garden that has for a very long time been a rose garden. Currently, this is planted with a number of heritage roses, the most fragrant delight in the summer months. The downside? The rabbits and deer view this part of the garden as an open invitation to a food buffet. Walk through the ornate iron gates and you enter an area of most change. The large area that produced produce for the house and its events has been reduced to a much smaller vegetable, fruit and cut flower area and a rose walk has been created. The roses in the rose walk were cultivated by Harkness Roses to commemorate the bicentennial of Jane Austen's death and are appropriately named Pride and Prejudice. A posy of these roses was taken by a library researcher and placed on the grave of Jane Austen in Winchester Cathedral on the anniversary of her death on the 18th of July 2017. Leaving the roses and a tantalising glimpse through a much smaller iron gate giving views to the gardener's cottage garden beyond originally the kitchen garden to the house. We come to the Elizabeth Blackwell Garden established in 2016. 
The garden was created in honour of Elizabeth Blackwell and her publication, A Curious Herbal, a large two volume book which we have in our collection. Elizabeth was the first woman to produce an illustrated herbal book. It contained 500 plates which she drew, printed and coloured, together with a description of the plants, their Latin and common names, and how they might be used to treat ailments. She did this all in an effort to release her husband from debtor's prison. It is a book that contains many images of plants from America, such as cocoa, coffee, potato, as well as many plants we may be very familiar with, such as the common dandelion. The Blackwell Garden itself is made up of two circles divided into four sections contained within a square plot. Each section refers to plants with medicinal properties that were considered beneficial to the chest, head, digestion or skin. Many of these plants are known as culinary herbs, such as thyme, rosemary and sage. Other plants, both in the book and planted here, have the ancient suffix wood that denotes a plant of yore, believed to have healing properties, such as lungwort, John's wort, and soapwort. Other plants in her book conjure up modern day images of magic and Harry Potter adventures, dragon tree, snakeweed, and mandrake, to name but a few. Leaving the walled garden, we stroll a short distance to the shrubbery. This part of the garden was created at a similar time to the walled garden, when the fields in which they stand were taken out of farm production. The shrubbery, overgrown and hidden for years, was rediscovered and reinstated in 2011-2012, with the gravel path, wide enough for two ladies, forming an oval linked to other walking tracks into the wilderness, the carriage ride or back into the gardens. The shrubbery was a place to walk, talk and reflect, and it features a lot in Jane Austen's novels. To the left and against the exterior south-facing wall of the walled garden, there would have been a more formal ornamental planting of the shrubbery. On the opposite side and alongside the park fence is a less formal, wilder area of the shrubbery. This is where the phrase to walk on the wild side comes from, referring both to the metaphorical and literal edge of the safe zone of a garden, especially for women, and the dangers beyond the fence. The park, seen at its best at the edge of the shrubbery, looks beyond to the woods of Chalton Park Wood, once owned by the Knight family, and to the park perimeter and carriage ride. Until the restoration period of the 1990s, this land was arable land and no longer belonged to the Knight family. The land was bought back by Sandy Lerner and Richard Knight and the parkland landscape reinstated in keeping with its history, its proximity to the house and to encourage wildlife. Chilton House has two parks, the North Park and the South Park, both of which are Grade 2 listed. Both these parks were expanded in the early 19th century and are of historical significance with ancient woodland throughout. They also contain a number of reinstated copses some with rather intriguing names such as Nicanocker Copse, Adela Copse and Mingle Down Plantation. There is also evidence of a viewing mound, now extensively reduced by repeated ploughing, that would have been part of an earlier formal garden design. From the edge of the park we can enter the wilderness, the oldest part of the gardens. It was originally set out geometrically like a series of St Andrew crosses, with crossing paths within rectangles. Although it was referred to as a wilderness, its geometrical design hints that it was never much of a wild wilderness, as we might think such a description would have implied today. Really, it was a level of wildness that acted as an antidote or relief to the more formal exacting design of the existing gardens of the 17th century and beyond. By 1743, here at Chawton House, we have evidence that these straight crisscrossing paths were already becoming more meandering. This peaceful, calm and natural oasis with glimpses between the trees of the park and distant views becomes a delight in February as the snowdrops carpet the wilderness in drifts of white and in May with the scent and colour of bluebells.
Continue along one of the tracks and you will emerge into the wide Lime Avenue, complete with an authentic shepherd's hut. Used by the shepherds during lambing, but used mainly by gamekeepers to keep an eye on the game birds and poachers. The Lime Avenue is one of the later features of the gardens and was believed to have been planted in about 1870. It suffered a lot of damage in the 1987 and the 1990 storms and it is hoped we will be able to reinstate some of the lost lime trees in the future. From the avenue that stretches away towards Farringdon to the left and right towards the house, a very good view opens up of the house's Jacobean three gabled facade built circa 1655. Avenues had been a very important feature within Grand Gardens and here at Chorlton we had at least two if not three other avenues or double rows of trees. These, like the enclosures of house and gardens, were increasingly considered old-fashioned in the 18th century and were removed in large numbers across the country. Jane Austen in Mansfield Park uses Fanny to lament the passing of the avenues and quotes one of her favourite poets, William Cooper, to express a sense of sorrow and regret and a palpable sense of change. A short stroll and we reach the South Lawn, a sweeping lawn that extends down from the upper terrace and down towards the church and the invisible ha-ha alongside. The ha-ha, on closer inspection, is a cut ditch with a hidden fence that keeps livestock in the field and out of the gardens. When viewed from afar, it creates an optical illusion across the land that there is no barrier or fence between the garden and, in this case, a meadow beyond. Horace Walpole describes its invention and use as a simple enchantment, a thing to be looked at across and not along so as not to spoil the magic. I hope you've enjoyed the charm and magic of Chawton House Gardens a little gem in a landscape that inspired one of our great authors, Jane Austen. I hope this has inspired you too to visit in real life when you can. So see you soon. Goodbye.